You've described WikiLeaks as untraceable and uncensorable. What do you mean by that? Well, nothing in this world is guaranteed for sure. But within that, um, we have put together an infrastructure using technical and legal techniques um, to really make it hard to trace people and make it hard to take down our material once it's published. Mm -hmm. And to date, uh, we've had a 100% uh, success rate. Mm -hmm. So that basic idea and intention uh, is comprised of a number of specific ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. So for untraceability, this means people send us material in the post in a particular way, mm -hmm. engaging in particular procedures, which makes it effectively impossible to trace. Or it means they submit material to us online and bounce the information mm -hmm. uh, through dozens of computers around the world, each computer encrypting its transmissions before it connects to another computer. So in this way, discarding um, identities mm. as the information flows around the world. Mm. As it flows through different countries, we make sure it flows through Sweden and Belgium. And these two countries have specific source protection laws. In Sweden, as part of the Swedish constitution, the Press Freedom Act. Mm. And in Belgium, a specific law dealing with the communications protections uh, between a source and a journalist using any means whatsoever, including electronic transmissions. Mm. For publication, this means housing our servers um, in many different jurisdictions, such that uh, any sort of interim attack on us, interim injunction, is not going to take the information down entirely. It may knock it out here, it may knock it out there. Mm. Um, but we can put up servers and gain support and respond legally fast enough such that the information is not going to be removed from the public. And that has been what has happened to date. We have never lost a court case in any jurisdiction. Mm. Um, important thing to remember. But there have been interim attempts to injunct us. And why those interim attempts have gone on, we have managed to keep publishing. Mm. How, many, how many documents of real value have you been able to accept and publish? Well, it's hard to know how many are real value. I mean, this is in the eyes of the beholder. Mm. Uh, to us, all information that is true has value eventually. Mm. Mm. It may only be a, a very small value to someone somewhere. Mm. Um, but getting that information into the historical record, padding out the historical record, provides a sort of richness to every other bit of information in the historical record. So if you're talking about things which have clearly changed outcomes of elections or clearly introduced some law reform or clearly brought perpetrators to trial, mm. then this is in, in the hundreds, yeah. some, somewhere in the hundreds, um, for the clearly changing governments or elections or having ministers mm. um, deposed, this is maybe half a dozen to ten, something like that. Mm. That's the power of information. It's an old truism, isn't it? And this is such a modern, ultra-modern form of getting it out. It must frighten um, a lot of establishments and authority, and especially governments. What governments have been successful in blocking it, in blocking yeah. WikiLeaks? The, the governments that have clearly uh, tried to interfere with readers' ability to look at what we publish mm. and um, leakers' ability to give us stuff, uh, China is the worst offender. Mm. China has the most aggressive, sophisticated um, sort of interception technology that places itself in between every reader inside China and every information source outside mm. China. Mm. And so we've been fighting a, a running battle to uh, make sure our information can get through. So there's all sorts of ways that Chinese readers can read our site. But the, the first thing that they try doesn't work. The first thing you would imagine doing, just go to wikileaks.org, um, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But variations on that do work. Mm -hmm. um, Iran uh, has blocked us as well for a period. Uh, however, we are now unblocked um, in Iran. Mm. Uh, the Australian government... 
uh, has added us to their list of secret internet sites that are to be blocked um, once a national sort of filtering system is put into place. That national filtering system has not yet been put into place, um, but if it is, we'll be on the list. That's the only Western government, is it? There's also Germany. Mm. Uh, has done a similar thing to Australia. I mean, they're in a similar position where they're trying to get up this national censorship system. It looks like it's not going to pass constitutional review. It looks like it won't get up. But mm. something important to understand is what happens in the West is privatised censorship. Mm. So, like it, most other institutions in the West, censorship has been privatised. And that means that big corporations go through the court system uh, to get injunctions and use the coercive power of the state, right, the ability to deploy armed police to force a court order. Um, mm. They use the court apparatus to do that. Mm. Um, they, I mean, there's other, other ways censorship occurs in the West mm. for economic pushes and so on. But to give a specific example, a private bank it deals with wealthy private clients, minimum mm. account balance of one million bucks hides their assets around the world to make sure creditors, ex-wives, police, tax departments, so on, can't get them. Um, we revealed the trust structures in the Cayman Islands, the beneficiaries who set up the trust, how much money was in it, and so on. And they attacked us in the United States. In so the courts? A, in the courts. So it's a Swiss Cayman o operation using US federal law to try and attack us. Um, they attacked the main registration URL that people are familiar with, wikileaks.org, mm. because one of the companies involved in registering that was based in California. Right. And through that interim injunction, they did take that down for 10 days. Now, of course, we were still publishing on all our other mm. URLs, still publishing successfully out of Sweden, but the, the thing that people were most familiar with uh, was no longer available. Mm. Um, and we then responded uh, with a coalition of, of 20 lawyers and, and managed to turn that around. So quite an interesting result. Mm. It's not that the US justice system brings justice. It's not that the US justice system is always unjust, but you have to bring justice to the US justice system. Mm. And if you have a big enough coalition with enough money, uh, you can force a good, a good verdict out of it. But mm. the initial verdict by the same judge was that we were to be shut down. Mm. It's interesting you mention justice there because I was going to ask you um, where the idea of WikiLeaks came from. But I mean, having the sense I get from you is that you've been using the technology, technology to mine this information, uh, especially within authority, for, for, for quite a long time. But there's, there's really something, there's another element to it. There is an element of justice seeking about WikiLeaks, it seems to me, almost a moral element. That's I, whole, won't, yeah. I won't go as far as saying as a crusade, but there is, there is a passion about it that's not just simply transparency. Um, there's something else. No, the goal is justice, the method is transparency. It's okay. important not to confuse the goal and the method. Mm -hmm. um, so what I observed by looking at how the press worked and how successful activist campaigns worked mm. is a very cheap and effective way of getting justice was finding information that people were spending effort on concealing and revealing it. Mm. Why do people spend effort on things? Well, because they believe it's going to benefit them. So. When organisations spend effort to conceal something, they are making a statement, they're giving off an economic signal that if that information is revealed, it's going to have an effect. Mm. Well, otherwise, why would you spend the work? Mm. So in many of those cases, the effect that it will have uh, is a push to reform the organisation mm. that is concealing some kind of abuse or some plan for some future abuse. Mm. Um, and so by selectively going after that information, as opposed to all the other sorts of information out there, which there are a vast amount, we are able to selectively bring about just 
change. The arrival of WikiLeaks coincides with a whole, uh, um, almost a sense of permanent war. The term permanent war, perpetual war, is constantly used now in the United States, where we have two wars running together and others, and other secret wars. In the information that you have revealed on WikiLeaks about these so-called endless wars, what has been the real high-value material that has come out that has given people, ordinary people if you like, the kind of information upon which they can then act? Looking at the, 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 the enormous quantity and diversity of these military or intelligence apparatus insider documents. Um, what I see is a, a vast, sprawling um, estate, uh, the in, what we would traditionally call the military intelligence complex or military industrial complex. And that this sprawling um, industrial estate um, is growing, becoming more and more secretive, becoming more and more uncontrolled. This is not um, mm. a sophisticated conspiracy controlled at the top. This is a, a vast movement of self-interest mm. by thousands and thousands of players uh, all working together uh, and against each other mm. to produce a, an end result, which is Iraq and Afghanistan and you know, Colombia mm. and, and keeping that going. So what, what I see is um, we should, you know, we often deal with tax havens and people hiding assets and transferring money uh, through mm -hmm. offshore tax havens. So I see some really quite remarkable similarities. Guantanamo is used for laundering people hmm. to an offshore haven, which doesn't follow the rule of law that we would normally expect. Tax haven is used for hiding people's assets, laundering people's assets through a jurisdiction which doesn't follow the rule of law that we would expect in our home countries. Similarly, Iraq and Afghanistan I, and Colombia are used to wash money out of the US, US tax base and back. Arms companies. Arms companies, yeah. Uh, and and the, the generals and so on, which are, if you like, non-profit versions um, so that you can't just or you mm. can't always pull out two billion bucks uh, from the US tax base and just say hey let's give it to give it to an arms company straight away with no expectation of doing any work but if you say this two billion dollars has got to go into Colombia but the Colombian government has to buy US arms and those arms has, have to be of a particular type, particular specification that only one of these arms companies has, mm. um, then that's just the way mm. of laundering this back into the United States. And what you're saying is that money and money making is at the center of modern war and it's almost self-perpetuating. Yes, and, mm. and it's becoming worse. Mm. Um, the number of private companies that sprung up around Iraq, um, the number of private companies that are now supporting uh, the National Security Agency. This mm. has in, uh, increased a hundred times in the past ten years. The number of companies. So now you have, a, a, you know, a, a school, a feeding school that is feeding off the U.S. tax base, and is a lobby to make sure that those wars go on. And you, know, you have two sorts of lobbies. You have offensive lobbies and defensive lobbies. So not an offensive lobby tries to get new money that it didn't have before mm. by lobbying the, the levers of government. And a defensive lobby makes sure that companies continue to receive the money that they've been getting before. Mm. So now we're in a position in the United States where we have both enormous offensive lobbies and enormous defensive lobbies. But the defensive lobbies always fight harder um, they fight to keep um, the expectation of the money flow going. Mm. And 
uh, that apparatus has been built up in the past 10 years. And I think it's um, mm. going to be extremely difficult uh, to dismantle. What was your reaction when you first saw the Apache video that is now infamous? Uh, when I first saw this, we didn't know that there were journalists in it. We didn't know who they were. We didn't know the circumstances. We knew this was a, a tape of a helicopter attack and otherwise nothing. Um, so I could immediately see that this was you know, a visceral attack on people walking in the street in a relaxed manner. Mm. Um, but I didn't know, were, were they armed? Were they really the bad guys? They seemed incredibly relaxed. It seemed like this was a, an attack that um, was very provocative. So if these people were um, insurgents, um, then they were insurgents on a, having a break playing on the street in a s suburb. Um, but as we dug deeper and deeper, uh, the situation became more and more appalling. Um, mm. So we found that clearly uh, nearly all of these people were not armed. Clearly there were two cameramen there holding cameras, not arms. Um, these cameramen turned out to be Reuters news reporters. Mm. Um, then looking at this wounded man crawling on the curb, um, we could spending more time in the detail, it was clear that there was no arms being picked up, that he was just being rescued by a passerby. Could you hear the voices? Could you hear the voices from the helicopter at this point? Yeah, we could hear the voices from the helicopter and, you know, sort of the, the grotesque language that uh, soldiers yeah. have. What really struck me was not the, uh, was not this very dark, grotesque humour. Mm. Um, I can accept that that it, people exercise black humour, very black humour sometimes in war. Uh, rather, it was the another day at the office mm -hmm. um, feel to routine. all the proceedings, how routine it was mm -hmm. to um, kill uh, these 18 to 26 people um, and that a whole street covered with bodies, the reaction to that was nice. Um, this tape for m me and the other people involved made nice a dirty word. Mm. So we just couldn't see something as being nice anymore when a whole street uh, covered with carnage uh, is nice. Mm. Nice, yeah. It, the, the reaction... Now let me ask you, wh what did you make of the... The, re the reaction to it in the media, the mainstream media reaction to the release of this video. We've been involved in, obviously, many different um, stories that have produced mm. fallout in the United States and in other countries. Um, but this one was of a degree and of a, you know, about a specific issue that we were able to sort of plot how all this unfolded and blew out and what mm. the back reaction was. So initially, on the TV networks, um, there was an attempt to immediately downplay this. Mm. So for example, CNN, uh, yeah. and Wolf, Wolf Blitzer, I mean, they only showed, they didn't, they took the first segment, which is not the most um, appalling one, the first attack, and then blanked out all the shooting, and then said this was out of sympathy or deference to the families. But there's no blood here, it just you can just see dust coming up. And then um, immediately started apologizing uh, for the military, mm. um, saying, oh, well, you know, it's, it's hard for our soldiers and a reminder that, you know, war is, war is difficult. Mm. Um, no condemnation, mm. not even any request for an inquiry, which is the sort of neutral mm. response well, we don't want to blame people before all the facts are in, although actually if you see the video, you've got most of them. But we want to know everything about this. We want this inquiry yeah. to be opened. We want mm. a full disclosure. We want to know why this video was withheld uh, from Reuters for so long. Mm. So all we want to know, uh, were the children 
were wounded compensated? Did they leave? All these things which have been sort of natural reactions um, did not take place uh, in the broadcast networks. Then, uh, for CNN and NBC, there was, I think, a sort of internal revolt by journalists who were seeing other journalists mowed down uh, in the streets of Baghdad. Mm. So a push back against the editorial management, management decision uh, to treat it so briefly and in such a biased way. So the next day saw a sort of richer um, discussion. And then it flipped. Then enormous editorial space, both in the printed press and in the TV press, opened up for military apologists and no space opened up for anyone else, including people with new facts, including the soldiers on the ground who were there, the only English-speaking witnesses, mm. the only US witnesses and the only soldiers speaking. Those people couldn't get into the mainstream press and couldn't get onto TV. Talk, talk about that one, the one soldier who, uh, uh, his name was McCord, is that right? Yeah. yeah, one of the soldiers on the ground who was one of those you see arriving at the van. Yes. Ethan McCord. Ethan McCord. Uh, is a soldier about 30 years old. Was in the ground unit that was being serviced, if you like, by the Apaches in the, in the mm. sky. And they marched in and arrived to where the bodies were and the shooting up the van. And Ethan heard the child crying in the van hysterically and pulled out the girl, saw the boy and thought the boy was dead. Mm. Took the child away from the van to a sort of intermediary location and then went to look for anyone else in the van and just saw the boy was just breathing and pulled him out. So he ended mm. up being covered with the blood of his children um, mm. and he was quite disturbed by this event and he got in contact with us um, immediately after uh, the video was published and he produced a statement of a letter of apology uh, to this mm. family. Of course he wasn't involved directly uh, with killing them but indirectly I mean, it was his unit that um, was being serviced uh, by this Apache mm. uh, and indirectly that it was he was part of the US Army um, in Iraq. Mm. But he says that you know, that he complained to his superiors about this event and they just told him to stop being a pussy mm. and to suck it up. Um, and he's tried uh, quite hard to draw attention to what happened uh, in the mainstream, to get the mainstream press interested in, uh, in it um, within two days of us revealing the material. So why it was still newsworthy, so there can't be any excuse um, in the US press too. Well, the, the moment had passed and therefore, okay, yes, his story is interesting, but the moment has passed. Because at the very same time mm. that he was trying to get his story across, editorial space was being given to military apologists mm. who were just, you know, war is hard and Mm. It's difficult. These to things happen. These things happen, and you didn't show the full context. And uh, that's they right. Were, they were shooting that morning, yep. uh, so on and so on. Yeah, yeah. And okay. you know, soldiers. It's difficult for soldiers, psychologically yeah. or whatever. Not new facts. Mm. Whereas, whereas this soldier mm. had new facts about mm. what had happened then and a, an incident that happened it, immediately he, after. I mean, what was interesting about him? He also had uh, an overview. And he described what had happened that day as a common occurrence. And he talked about if, if there was any kind of threat or perceived threat to American soldiers, they would, they would let everybody have it. Uh, he said, let, let all the motherfuckers have it at 360 degrees. That's right. If, if there was an idea. He, uh, he was in, there was an IED. Yeah, if he was instructed mm. by his commanding mm. officer that mm. if there, yeah. if an IED goes off um, yeah. anywhere in the street, yeah. um, then mm. 360 degree rotational fire and just take out everyone, women, yeah. children, everyone gets it. Uh, 
I guess, as a, to try and act as a disincentive yeah. uh, for the local population for, for supporting uh, any IED placement. And, and, and that's what happened. Yes. I mean, it, it's, yeah. it's not that he was told that and it didn't happen, but rather no. that yeah. happened and he was instructed. Yeah. So he and some other soldiers in this unit who didn't like that instruction apparently fired high uh, when those orders came, when an IED went off and they were instructed to fire those orders. What, what, what do the leaks uh, around this issue tell you about whether this particular incident was, as the government, the US government claims, an aberration or not? Well, we have seen in other leaks, I mean, uh, just a, a vast number of these type of incidences. And when I say these type, what I mean is indiscriminate attacks on civilians. Mm. Not deliberate attacks on civilians, it's important to make clear, but just not giving a damn. Mm. Not caring um, whether they are or whether they aren't. Sometimes occasional attack, deliberate attacks on civilians, but those do seem to be rare in the record. But just, you know, maybe they are, maybe they're not, but we want to shoot. Uh, and so go, so go for it. Now, Ethan McCord and one of his fellow soldiers who were in that ground unit, they say that they were surprised it was this video that leaked because there were many, many worse incidences and this mm. was a sort of everyday mm. occurrence. Mm. It's not every day that journalists are killed. Although I did read the statistic that uh, there have been seven Reuters journalists killed in Baghdad and all of them uh, were killed by US military fire. Mm. But probably the only reason we are talking about this now is because there were two journalists there and they were sort of trackable and Reuters put in a Freedom of Information Act request. Whereas if they weren't journalists, if they were just regular citizens of Baghdad, um, we wouldn't even be talking about it. The material just would have been buried. There would have been no uh, internal investigation at all, which prompted the eventual leaking. So this is a kind of tip of an awful iceberg in many ways, isn't it? Because a war like Iraq and a war like Afghanistan if not directed at civilians, civilians become the casualties. They're civilians' wars, in a, way, in a sense, aren't they? You know, there's the old statement that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And you can see from this video that when you're in an Apache with a, a zoom lens that can show you people's face from one mile up in the sky, and you have a 30 millimeter cannon, and you shoot and there's no effect against you. You can't even hear the screams. And when you get back to base, there's no discipline procedures against you. That when this happens every day, for days, you know, for a year, of course, it's incredibly corrupting. Mm. And you know, pe these people are, are shot in the same way that, that the everyday person uh, walks over ants on the street because they just seem to be irrelevant. They don't complain, there's no discipline procedure. And so as the war goes along, civilians do become just something to you know, get rid of uh, because they're uh, annoying um, or have no concern uh, over. Mm. And while there, there are, um, while some of these uh, civilian massacre cases do achieve prominence, and then I do um, I find uh, genuine concern um, by some of the higher generals or by other groups looking into them. That's not what we see for the everyday cases of civilian kills. And we have acquired records um, of six years worth of civilian kills for Iraq and Afghanistan, and not just the big ones, mm. where there's 100 people killed or 20 people killed, mm. where there is some investigation or publicity sometimes, but rather these sort of everyday uh, incidences where a man might be, in one, as in one case in Afghanistan, a man is seen to be running away after US soldiers approach 
and they try and shoot him, their guns jam, so he's running towards the village. So what do they do? The guns have jammed, they get the artillery, and they shell him. There's one man, they launch shells towards him, they overshoot, hit the village, and they kill a five-year-old boy. So there's mm. hundreds and hundreds of those small incidences which sort of reveal the, the squalor of war at a, at a microscopic mm. detail. It's not always these big kill events. It's uh, these little events where there's a, a lack of concern and care about the sort of lethal engagement or the use of lethal force. Another example in it from Afghanistan is uh, the American troops going through an area. They're not receiving fire, but they see some unexploded ordnance. They see a 1.5-metre uh, shell that's sitting there in a, in a sort of dusty area. And could it be a booby trap? Possibly. Could be a booby trap. Might not. I mean, they could just walk past. Mm. What should they do? Should they shoot it? Should they call in their bomb disposal squad, which is what you would normally do, mm. um, and have it taken care of? No. They call in airstrike instead to take out just this one unexploded shell. Um, now, presumably, that these are guys in Afghanistan, they're bored. They want to mm -hmm. see what an airstrike's like up close. It's very easy, it's in the daytime. So they call an airstrike, the airstrike overshoots, the shell hits a village. So this is sort of just a, a lack of concern, a lack of care. Are these particular incidents from the documents <coughs> that you've released in July? Yes, that's right. Mm. Yeah. And the, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds like that. Can you just describe the almost the panorama of these documents? They're across Afghanistan and yeah, Iraq. And Iraq. Aren't they? So for, for Afghanistan, this is 91,000 reports by troops on the ground mm. uh, and by some intelligence people back at the base. These are like done just after an event happens or are updated during the course of the day. So they mm. sort of raw data before before Pentagon spin doctors have had a chance to massage it. Although that said, sometimes troops don't put things in there that might incriminate them either. Mm. Um, and for Iraq, this is 490,000 reports over the same period. 490,000? 490,000 over the, the same period of time. <laughs> That's a hell of a leak. <laughs> yeah, that's a really extraordinary thing. This is the, the most finely detailed history of war uh, that has ever been disclosed. Precise times, locations, kill counts. Although the kill counts are sometimes massaged. Um, but kill counts, people detained. What happened from the US troops' point of view? Mm. Now, they're not reliable narrators, but you can't hide everything when you're producing so much detail so quickly. And, I mean, it's just extraordinary. So we wrote a computer program to add up all these kill counts. Um, and so for Afghanistan, this is in the hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. It's important to remember this wasn't just a, we got an aggregate figure of a hundred of thousands. This hundreds of thousands is a result of adding up all the individual cases which are documented. So the individual cases, the, the highest kill count um, was 480 or so uh, related to a, a stampede that occurred on a bridge. Uh, 480 people were killed. In, sure. Look, in checking this in the news reports, it seems like it was more like a thousand people were killed, but in the internal US military reporting it's 480 people mm. uh, who were killed. and. But that's the single highest event. That's a sort of un, a bit unusual. The next one down was a, a U.S. sweeping operation that killed about 300. Um, some of these events are, on the surface, um, disturbing. So the highest kill count event in Afghanistan uh, killed 181 people in a U.S. operation uh, led by Canada uh, called Operation Medusa 
in the Dece uh, December 2006. And that kill count of 181, there was only one wounded. One wounded? One wounded. It says no civilians were killed and there were no captures. So if we then look at what was the sort of military hardware deployed, so it, it speaks about some ground force sweep and, and so on, and a couple mm. of people being killed there, but nearly everyone uh, who is listed being killed was killed by a <coughs> an AC-130 gunship. So this is, an AC-130 is a big, big yeah. cargo plane, which is being converted to have, be decked out with machine guns and tank guns and... Uh, so saturation uh, fire yeah, from that. From yeah. high up, but it's a plane yeah. that's moving. I yeah. mean, this is, it's not exact. Mm. Um, and yeah, in the course of three hours, 62 people are described as being killed by this. And then there's also an unexplained missing um, 90 or so people. How they are killed is not established in the report, but they are listed uh, as having been killed in two places. And do they call these all uh, Taliban, the enemy? Uh, yeah, they're all called the enemy. Looking at, looking at that Operation Reducer kill, um, that broader operation, it's quite interesting. I mean, I hadn't heard about this before, but this was the, the biggest, according to the Canadian military, the biggest operation in Afghanistan post-invasion. And, but Afghanistan wasn't on people's radar in t December 2006, Iraq was. Um, but during that week, they say that they killed about a thousand um, Taliban. But actually what happened is that this was in a, a region of about 20k out of uh, Kandahar, where there's lots of vineyards, and um, there was an ex the government installed by um, U.S. forces post the 2001 invasion had become extremely corrupt, and the local people had grown to support the Taliban in a sort of united effort to clean out this government, and then when. US and Canadian and well, uh, when ISAF, sort of mm. the allied forces, NATO. Alli the Western forces yeah. came in, mm -hmm. um, these people, not just Taliban, and they do seem to have been Taliban there, but the, the local population were supportive. And so the men in the vineyards, the, the workers in the vineyards uh, were killed along with these others. Um, and it seems to, if we read the press reports at times, some press say it's 50-50, 50% Taliban, 50% local people. It's pretty hard to gauge from the, mm. the on-the-ground on the reporting. But we look at events like this leaked document shows and we see something pretty disturbing. A lot of people killed, very little time, using indiscriminate fire, um, no investigation into 181 people being killed, the biggest kill on mm. a single event. Um, in Afghanistan post 2001, uh, it doesn't it doesn't mm. smell right. Yeah, I suppose th those doing the killing, who I, I'm assuming they regard everybody as the Taliban or as insurgents. Well, it, the pattern. The, so who isn't yeah. children? The, uh, pat the pattern we see in Iraq and Afghanistan, the, the very clear pattern, and it's not just me who sees this, but other war reporters, yeah. is that anyone who's a man is and dead is an insurgent. That's how they are always listed on the reports. And it's only after there's some investigation, usually stimulated by the press or mm. by um, a competing military reporting on it, um, mm. that then there's a sort of pull down from that number. Yeah. So yeah. Not any, any man who is dead is insurgent or Taliban, children, if their bodies are whole enough to see, and remember things like 30 millimeter cannon fire will decimate a body, um, are listed as children. So they're not listed as insurgents and women can go either way. And <laughs> so as an example, if we look at Kunduz, this is um, an airstrike that uh, occurred in Afghanistan last year where uh, uh, it was called in by the German military yeah. Petrol tankers, mm -hmm. uh, about three kilometres away from the German military positions, had been put in a riverbed, and the local people were unla unlading the petrol from them, taking this off. Now, 
the, the allegation is that the Taliban uh, hijacked these petrol tankers and were then giving the petrol to the local population, which is quite possibly true. I mean, maybe they're trying to curry favour with the local population, but the reality is there was over 100 people clustered around this tanker, mm. tanker taking the petrol, and they weren't going anywhere, they were sitting there. Um, so mm. airstrike was called in and killed most of these people. Yet, when we look at the internal military reporting by the United States, what we see is, in these leaked reports, 57 insurgents killed. When we look at the internal military reporting for um, the collateral murder, this uh, Iraq um, massacre, which included two Reuters journalists that happened in July 2007, what we see is um, 14 people killed, and there were actually between 18 to 26 people killed, and all of them insurgents, except for two children who were wounded. Hmm. And so so even the Reuters cameramen were listed as insurgents. As insurgents. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Until Reuters came in contact mm. and said, hey, where's our cameraman? Yeah. But, I mean, for you to receive that volume of documentation suggests that there must be something of a rebellion going on within the system. Yes. It, I mean, it's the one hopeful thing is, in fact, that there are good people in the US military. There are good people in mm. military intelligence organizations. And some of those people have had enough. And so they provide, provide us with uh, evidence of mm. abuse. And I mean, that's, um, mm. it is a, it's sort of another way of being a conscientious objector. In fact, um, arguably a far more powerful way of objecting uh, yeah. to the war. Yeah. And what about among journalists? Is there a rebellion amongst journalists? Uh, you said uh, some time ago, I think, that journalists uh, need to respect their readers and viewers. Um, how, how, do, how do journalists, by and large, react to WikiLeaks. Of course, some are very impressed, obviously, but you've described, for example, the reaction in the United States with CNN and NBC and CBS and so on as journalists being used to justify it. So how do journalists, how, how are journalists dealing with the arrival of WikiLeaks? Yeah, a very interesting mixture. So. You know, it seems like all the good journalists support us and all the, all the bad ones don't. <laughs> but, of course, maybe that's just my interpretation based upon <laughs> their support. <laughs> Probably a good interpretation. But um, it does seem that the, the more accomplished and independent the journalists, the more they are likely to support us. Mm. Um, the more they are able, in fact, to... The more established they are as an independent journalists with their own independent reputation that they can choose to take from one newspaper to another. They can choose to take from one network to another mm. if they're stuffed around. Um, it seems like the more they are able to state their support uh, for us, mm. whereas the journalists who are not in that position of freedom, that are more part of a, the group of, of the company, that they're company men, um, they're more likely to be critical. And because your very WikiLeaks is very threatening to systems. And uh, the BBC is a system. Um, the network making this documentary, ITV, is a system. So individual journalists, as opposed to the organisations that they're working in, are supportive of us in that they may be able to collaborate with us or use our material. and. That can be extremely important material, and some people um, have an ability to see that, and they want to help and, and sort of get that material out to the public or bring extra angles in, in on it or use their existing understanding to help flesh mm. it out. So they see us as, you know, as um, colleagues. And then we have a group that sees us as competition, that sees us as a threat, and in the regular sort of competitive, news competitive mm. sense. 
but also in that we are demanding certain standards, certain higher levels of information, harder to get information, and the use of primary sources in mm. material that has been released in print. Mm. So that makes them have to work harder. Mm. So they see us as a threat. And then there's another group that appreciate, appreciates what we're doing because we're drawing the fire. Mm. So we are the free press vanguard. We are the sort of defender of whistleblowers and we move that whole field further out. And that mm. creates a sort of a vacuum behind us into which these people can come, which doesn't have any fire because we're, we're attracting the opposition by pushing the mm -hmm. envelope. And that's quite nice because over the last four years, we have been changing the standard. Mm. So to some degree, we are now the status quo. Mm. We, we are something that exists. There's an economic and political and social niche. You're the mainstream. Don't go quite that far, but, but it, there's an understanding, a political and economic understanding that there is a place for WikiLeaks yeah. in this world. And that if we were to disappear, that would be something new. Mm. I mean, it's quite, yeah, it's quite interesting that how I, you've shifted in. I mean, here, uh, uh, the Guardian media pages uh, every year lists the 100 most important media people. You've probably seen this. This year, they've included you. Yeah, this year, you know, uh, 58. But last year, we weren't in there at all. <laughs> That's quite an improvement. The fact that you're in there is interesting. Very interesting. I mean, I, it's true we do have some influence, but I think it's also the case that those people in the Guardian, whoever put that list together, and I'm sure it's a totally accurate list, but um, I'm sure that's also a desire. There's a desire for us to be leading in that way mm. and that they want to support, um, support mm. us and mm. see that we do something mm. beneficial for them, which is to, to open up this space. I mean, there's, there's clearly a big shift underway, and we've talked about this already. Um, but the shift is from traditional, so-called mainstream journalists, journalism, to what has become known as citizen journalism. It, is that... Is that a very significant shift now? It's, is, it, is the whole nature of journalism likely to change because of this, this trend? It is changing, uh, and the, the changes will be dramatic. But I'm not one to sell citizen journalism as being, at the moment, um, being a great answer yet. Mm. And because what I see in the alternative press is very little journalism going on. Mm. In fact, what I see is people taking the front page of the New York Times, using that as their issue of the day and saying, I don't agree with it or I do agree with it. Mm. Um, and when our idea is that our material would spark tremendous amounts of citizen journalism because all these people who write opinion pieces on blogs and so on, when given the complaint, why aren't you doing any real journalism? Why aren't you going and research or investigating something? Mm. They say, well, it takes a long time to build up sources. So we don't have anything new to talk about. So we have to just analyze mm. what the mainstream press are doing. So, but mm. we have produced a, a hundreds of thousands or millions of millions mm. of pages um, of new source material mm. that these people could analyze and could report. And it's extremely rare that they do. Mm. So that mm. the specific example that I like to use is we got hold of a classified US intelligence report into what happened in the war in Fallujah. So this was a left cause celebrity um, that um, invasion of the town of Fallujah in Iraq in 2004. Of course, Iraq itself had already been mm. invaded, but Fallujah was some kind of holdout to the new government that had been put in place by the United States, the Coalition Provisional Authority. Mm -hmm. And 
that uh, the circumstances of that invasion was some U.S. contractors uh, who were going through mm-hmm. this area mm. uh, had had been killed, and anyway, mm. so not wanting to go into the detail, but that was a, a very bloody um, invasion, and it ended up with a pullout and a, a reinvasion some five months later. Mm. So, what were the circumstances? Everyone knew that all sorts of tragedy had occurred in that town. This report, in fact, revealed both how things progressed militarily, how things progressed politically, spoke specifically about Paul Bremer, who was the the head of the Coalition Provisional Authority, the role of Al Jazeera Mm. in that town, the the media war, as well as the -the on-the-ground war. The different tribal regions, classified secret via U.S. Mm. Army ground intelligence. So we took this classified U.S. intelligence report about Mm. Fallujah Mm. and released it. Mm. So all citizen journalists, academics, Mm. employee journalists could analyze it, write about it, Mm. call up the U.S. military, ask them about it, Mm. ask uh, the countries involved, human Mm. rights groups, what was going on, etc. This was the, the raw primary ingredient that you needed to actually do some journalism and mailed this out to 3,500 people uh, on our mailing list. And the result was not a single citizen journalist did anything. The first person to publish was a friend, Sean Waterman at UPI, who was the national security reporter. Um, And then another five um, professional press journalists not all of them full-time journalists, some mm. working for the Asia Times half-time and working for the Cato Institute half-time as an example of one of these five. Yeah. But um, the bloggers, the political activists of all kinds, uh, in fact, didn't do anything with this material. So, I mean, that's interesting. So real information or can almost paralyze as if they don't know what to do with it. Well, I... Over time, we are seeing that we're sort of training people up a bit. Mm. So it's getting better over time. People are starting to become used to this military information and nomenclature, understanding that when we release it is is definitely true. Um, But yeah, Yeah. a very surprising effect. I mean, that report, Mm. as an example, it looked good. It wasn't Mm. just that it had important details. Mm. It wasn't too long. It was Mm. only... Mm. It was accessible. 30 pages. It was accessible. Mm. It had a nice map of Fallujah on the front, split into tribal regions. And no one picked it up. No one picked it up. It, <laughs> and eventually, um, professional press picked it up. Mm. You're making some very serious enemies, um, uh, not least of all, a government engaged in two rapacious wars. I, I, how do you deal with what must be a sense of that danger? Do you ignore it or do you um, accommodate it within yourself? So, not at all. I I think, um, you know, a lot of people say uh, we're very courageous in our work. Mm. And I wouldn't reject that label entirely. We're not uncourageous. But to me, courage is not the absence of fear at all. Courage Mm. is sort of the the intellectual mastery of fear by understanding. So we just understand what the risks are and mm. having understood them, we're able to navigate the path through them. Mm. One of my good friends who's a, a reporter for the Standard newspaper in Kenya, mm. investigative head, whenever he is about to publish a big story exposing the Kenyan government and they were raid, the newspaper was raided by the police a couple of years ago, mm. um, he publishes, he goes to Tanzania he waits to see what happens. Eventually it becomes clear what's going to happen and he comes back. If he doesn't understand the risk, if he understands the risk and he sees that it's, it's relatively low risk, then he publishes and he stays in Nairobi. And so that's how we work. Is what, by what, 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 what do you do? Because you're, I would have thought, unlikely to go to the United States at the moment. Well, in July of... 2010, um, I had three uh, speaking engagements in the United States. Mm. 
including one at the investigative reporters and editors conference in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. um, a panel there with Scott Risen, a uh, New York Times national mm -hmm. security reporter, and mm -hmm. Valerie Plain was also in the panel. Mm -hmm. I cancelled my visit uh, to the United States uh, because of some information that was coming out from our sources um, within the US administration saying that it would be a danger to me uh, to go to the United States. Mm. In the, uh, in the Pentagon recently, I asked the Assistant Secretary of Defense, Brian Whitman, uh, this. I said, can you, as a senior official of the United States government, can you give a guarantee that the editors of WikiLeaks and the editor-in-chief himself, who is not American, that's you, are not in danger, that they themselves will not be subjected to the kind of hunt that we've read about in the media. And uh, his reply in a nutshell, well, first of all, it's not my position to give guarantees on anything. I mean, how do you feel about that? Well, it sounds like keeping all options on the table uh, to me. And But they're not good options, are they? I don't, I don't want to dramatize this too much, but you're in a sort of unique position, in a way, um, aren't you? I don't We're think in there's a been a WikiLeaks yeah, before. There hasn't, and they don't know how to deal with us. And there's mm. no, I mean, something that has preserved us is that there's no, um, in the United States or in any other country, there is no department to deal with WikiLeaks. Yeah. Uh, most of those government departments are split up into regional focuses. Mm. Um, so there's no sort of specialist in, in dealing what with what we are or understanding what we are or understanding how to deal with us. But, mm. I mean, there are serious statements coming out of the US administration under the surface that um, imply that they would not follow the rule of law. Uh, that's a, a they would not follow the rule. Implied that they would not follow the rule of law, and that, that is a serious matter. There's a certain record there, yeah. And there were senior figures like Cy Hirsch giving me warnings, uh, mm. a famous US national security reporter. And so, I mean, we listened uh, to those mm. warnings and took appropriate uh, security mm. precautions. That said, I think our political position uh, in countries like United Kingdom. Australia, Iceland, Germany, um, and other countries l with less strength um, mm. is, is such that it is impossible to, I mean, arrest me here in the United Kingdom. Mm. Politically, uh, it is just not possible to do that. Mm. Um, yeah. Now, why some intermediary bureaucrat might do it and not understand the political risk, um, eventually the matter would be pushed up high enough uh, and, you know, mm. people in a, with better understanding of politics mm. uh, will go, do not do that. Uh, that's just going to create a, a terrible political dilemma for everyone concerned. Don't do it. I, I, I note your, your preemptive strike in, uh, in response when you posted on WikiLeaks a leaked Pentagon document that says that the US intelligence intends to destroy WikiLeaks and the words used are that they would f wanted to fatally marginalise the organisation. Um, yeah, and uh, destroy our centre of gravity. Mm. They're using a sort of military language, which is yeah. what they say is the, the trust that sources and public have in us. If they can destroy that, then they can stop US military whistleblowers coming to us. And they say the word whistleblower. I mean, they're, mm. they're not talking about... Um, or at least not just talking about unauthorised disclosures which may or may not be revealing abuse. They are saying whistleblowers, people who reveal abuse, they give examples. Examples mm. given are Guantanamo Bay, when we mm. released the main manuals for this, which revealed that they were hiding people from the Red Cross, falsifying documents and so on. Um, mm. Fallujah mm. and abuses that we revealed there and a number of other cases. So these are, they are upset with us because we are revealing abuses and embarrassing uh, the United States military. Mm. Uh, so we released that report, which was written in 2008. We released this uh, earlier in 2010. Mm. Um, 
as, as you know, maybe as a preemptive strike. I mean, it's putting them on notice. Uh, mm. And by us releasing that, there is an understanding. You know, that didn't come from nowhere. That report clearly came from some intelligence insiders in the United States. We have support inside the US intelligence community. Uh, mm. So it is, it is difficult and dangerous uh, for people within the US intelligence community to try and investigate us because there will be dissidents uh, that will step forward um, mm. and reveal that. So they have to tread very carefully. What happens when you return to Australia, your homeland? Because when you went back recently, um, they took away your passport, um, saying that it was looked worn and uh, something uh, you perhaps needed a new one. But miraculously, you didn't need a new one. They gave it back to you some time later. Yeah, and, and just a little bit after that, they uh, also searched my bags and made references to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Australian Federal Police, uh, specific mm. information uh, that had to have come off their database file. Mm. So it's quite interesting. In Australia, I mean, there is a sort of patriotism in Australia that is proud uh, of WikiLeaks and proud of me. Mm -hmm. And that is defensive. And as a result, there have been um, very positive articles in, in the Fairfax Press and uh, in the Australian. Um, mm. So I'm told by my you know, politically connected people in Australia that uh, it would be extremely difficult to arrest me, detain me or deport me uh, yeah. or our other uh, volunteers in Australia. That said, uh, there has been extensive spying mm. um, on our people in that country, mm. um, mm. which I assume has been agreed to in some mm. way by the Australian government, and we yeah. have mm. some information about the Australian government being involved in that. It, is it hard after a while to keep these shadows at bay do you get used to them? You must say to yourself, look, I, I, I can't become paranoid about this. You know, I'm going to live a normal life. Is that difficult? Oh, it's become pretty easy. I mean, yeah. we have some security precautions, we have some security procedures, we have different people doing different things in different places depending on mm. their need for security. Uh, mm. For me, I mean, it doesn't matter if I'm followed around Mm. Uh, provided I'm not meeting with a source. Quite a few BBC journalists who have got in touch with me and want to talk about um, the pressure within the BBC. In other words, Great. they represent the kind of rebellion that you're describing. What would you say to people like them in an institution like the BBC, or indeed journalists who are led by their conscience or just by their professional integrity within certain organisations. What would you say to them? What can they do? Oh, when, when your stories are killed, get them to us and we'll publish them. That's the, the simplest one. Or when the primary source material is is um, suppressed, get them to us. I mean, you, d you don't have to leave the institution. You can work on the inside and on the outside and keep this line between the two invisible. Um, so what they can't get on air and what they can't get in the paper, give to yeah, WikiLeaks. Yeah. Now, un yeah. Unfortunately, that doesn't, you know, there's, no, there's not so much career motivation to do that because you kind of uh, stick your name on it um, at the time. But later on, maybe you can put your name on it, you know, when you leave the institution. What wouldn't you accept? Yeah. What wouldn't you publish? What leak wouldn't you publish? Unlike every other news organisation, we say precisely in policy what we will and will not mm. accept for the material that we publish. So we say to whistleblowers, we will take material that hasn't appeared before. It is being some force suppressing it, legal or... Mm threat of violence or being fired, um, and that is of diplomatic, political, ethical or historical significance, and that you didn't write yourself. So, provided it fits that, 
we will publish it. Now, we might go through some harm minimization process in the interim. So the, the only forms that that has taken is, uh, as an example, the British National Party, when we published their secret yeah. uh, membership list. We contacted all these people ahead of time and we said, oh, we're going to publish this in a few days. Um, we're giving you the heads up just in case mm -hmm. this, you know, your telephone number being public and so on causes problems. You go and sort it out. So that has always worked so far. We're aware of no instance where anyone mm. has come to any sort of physical harm uh, mm. as a result of anything we've published. We are aware of quite a few results where people have been fired or lost elections as a result of things that we've published, but mm. that yeah. seem to be on the side of the angels. Um, if at some stage that policy doesn't seem to be working, mm. uh, then we'll create a new policy. Remember, our goal is just as our means is transparency. We don't confuse these two. The propaganda efforts of governments has become vast. I read an AP investigation that said the US was spending four point, had spent 4.7 billion over the last five years on basically winning hearts and minds, not of the enemy, but of its own people. Yep, yep. Um, I mean, this, this kind of information war and Petraeus, General Petraeus and his counterinsurgency manual refers to wars of perception in which the media is, is one of the weapons. Um, it, it, so information war has never been more important. But what happens when WikiLeaks runs into the United Kingdom, which has some of the most draconian secrecy laws in the world, such as the Official Secrets Act? Is it more difficult here to, to mine information? We haven't found a, a problem publishing uh, UK information. Mm. I mean when we look at the Official Secrets Act label documents, um, we see they state that it is an offence to retain the information and it is an offence to destroy the information. So the only possible outcome is that we have to publish the information. Um, and that's what which you've done. we have done on, on many, many occasions. I, I noticed one that one of one of the, those that I uh, had a, a personal interest in was one that uh, from the Ministry of Defence classified document that um, equated uh, terrorists with investigative journalists as threats and Russian spies and Russian spies. Yeah, as as in fact in many sections of that report, investigative journalists are the number one uh, threat to the sort of information security uh, I, I, of the Minist Ministry of Defence. That was a 2,000-page a document on how to stop leaks uh, from yeah. the Ministry of Defence, which, which we leaked. I didn't know whether to be uh, offended or honoured. Well, um, it's ni nice to be having a, an, an impact. <laughs>